Welcome, everybody. This is Matt Erpelding, the Vice President of Government and Community Relations from the Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce. And today we have a very exciting conversation that is centered around the COVID-19 pandemic and the adaptations and educational changes that are going to be taking place this fall in our K-12 education system. We have some great guests with us. But before we get to our guests, I first just want to thank first everyone who has tuned in and continues to tune into these events. The Boise Metro Chamber of Commerce is the only five star accredited U.S. Chamber of Commerce member in Idaho. And I feel the work that we do is really to provide you with information about what's happening in terms of current events and in policy making uh, across the state. As you know, we're an organization that's highly dependent upon our membership and our members continue to be supportive of our educational programming. Today, we have two incredible sponsors. We have DL Evans Bank and we have Sparklight, who continues to be the presenting sponsor of our education series this August. Each of them are incredible supporters of the chamber and we are so lucky to have them. And before we start with our panel discussion, here's a brief message from Sparklight. Right now, we're all working a little differently or maybe even working from a different place. Sparklight Business is here to help businesses work through this by connecting you to your customers in new ways, by connecting coworkers with tools to collaborate. Our experts will connect you to the speed, reliability, and technology you need so you can keep connecting to what matters most when it matters most. Because your life's work is why we work. Sparklight Business. We'll work through this together. And today we have three excellent panelists from a wide array of educational background. We're very excited to have them. I'm going to start by introducing Kobe Dennis. Kobe's been dedicated to the field of public education throughout his professional career. His service to the Boise School District began in 1991 and has included serving students as a classroom teacher and assistant principal at both the junior and senior high levels. He's worked as a junior high principal, area director, and deputy superintendent. He earned a bachelor's degree in secondary education and a master's in educational specialist degree in education administration from the University of Idaho. We are lucky to have him. And then we have Kelly Edgington. Edgington. And Kelly, we are so happy to have you here today. Kelly earned her bachelor's degree in education from the University of Idaho and her master's degree in educational administration from the University of Phoenix Online. She began her career in education as a teacher in the Idaho Falls School District 91 and joined the Idaho Virtual Academy. The year the school opened in 2002, she served as a teacher, a principal, a high school principal, federal programs director, and director of academics at IDVA, and is currently head of the school. Thank you, Kelly, for joining us. And finally, Andy Grover. Dr. Grover is here today. He is the executive director of the Idaho uh, Association of School Administrators and was previously the superintendent for the Melba School District for 12 years. He also was a Republican candidate for the superintendent of public instruction in 2014. He taught for eight years in the Bonneville School District and was originally hired to be the principal at Melba High before being elevated to superintendent. He received his undergraduate at Boise State and continued to work until he received his doctorate. You know, the three of you, it's just so great to have you today because the reality is, is education is a is kind of a bit of a conundrum right now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we get started, how, how are you all handling this personally? Um, I'll go ahead and start then. <laughs> um, personally, it, it hasn't changed my life a ton besides wearing a mask out in public. Um, I, my husband and I have been taking a lot more drives and I'm working at home rather than the office. So been going all right. Andy? Well, I've still gone to work every day through almost the entire thing. Uh, when, when I was out in Melbourne, now here at the office at IASA, and just working on trying to figure out how we're going to best educate kids in this uh, pandemic. So I think it's a different stress than maybe I had last, you know, six months ago, but it's still the same outcome of how do we best educate our kids? Kobe. 
Um, well, first of all, I, I, uh, I appreciate being here, Matt, and, and the chamber and everything. So um, thank you to the chamber and Bree and you for putting this together. Um, from a personal note, um, it, I think it's been as challenging a time as I think we've ever had to face in public education, just to be blunt about it. Um, it the entire um, premise of what we thought we knew kind of got turned up up down upside down during this time and um and but one of the things that has been kind of constant for me is i know we have some unbelievable educators out there that are going to do an unbelievable job um, no matter what the format is in delivering curriculum and and getting our kids um, educated to the best possible way we can so on a personal note um challenging uh, but no more challenging than what any anybody else is facing out there right now. So, uh, but I appreciate the question. Absolutely. You know, let's start with you, Andy. You you were hired in April as the executive director of the Idaho School Administrators. But I just want to talk a little bit about background before we get to that. And so the Central District Health and other health um, a, uh, districts around the state have been using a color-coded system to help school districts make decisions with regard to their planning process. Can you speak a little bit to the color coding um, uh, tools that have been provided by the health districts and how they're being used by districts across the state to make decisions with regard to the future of uh, K-12 education? I can, and, and it's a good question. You know, the, the health departments are obviously playing a big role in school district decisions. And, you know, there's seven health districts around the state all governed by their own body and all have the ability to come up with uh, whatever scenario they feel is best for their district. You know, they're, they're all determining what community spread is and they've created these uh, color codes, as you mentioned, to help districts be able to say, you know, in these certain areas, how are we gonna instruct students? And as I've looked at probably the large majority of re-entry plans across the state, almost all of them tie in some way to this color code. The reopening uh, guidelines that were set forth by uh, the state board earlier in, I guess in late June, also build off of these uh, color codes. So the importance of where community spread lies in each of our individual districts is so important because they're, they're basing their reopening uh, on that and reopening being whether that's uh, virtual or whether that's live having students there. The the other clarification, uh, Kobe, is that the I don't think the general public truly understands the difference between online education, hybrid online education, and virtual education. The Boise School District has gone decided to open the school uh, semester with the first two weeks being an online and virtual education. Can you help clarify first the difference between those two? And second, uh, if it's virtual education, how are we holding the teachers to ensure that there's virtual delivery every single day? Um, yeah, Matt, I, I think to kind of start with the first part of your question, what's the difference between virtual and in-person? I, I, I want to, or excuse me, virtual and online. I, I think the best way to say it right now is that that's just really semantics. Um, we are... Um, our teachers are being trained in a couple of different um, platforms. So if you are in an online or a Boise online school, um, at, you're gonna have one type of platform versus if you are in our in-person school, which is what we call our virtual, um, you'll have a different kind of a platform. So without getting into um, the, the details of those, one is more appropriate for the other. I think for for the the audience today, I think probably the most important thing for them to understand is they're going to be assigned to a teacher. A teacher is going to be delivering the curriculum um, in a in a virtual way. Um, we're not going to have in person classes right now, but every single day the teacher is going to be touching base with the kids. There will be a, there will be direct instruction or one on our classroom instruction whole group instruction, all of that will take place every day during the classroom, irrespective of the platform that they are that they are using. 
Um, I think what's going to be important, particularly for our community right now, is to understand that first week is really going to be about us trying to make sure everybody can log on, everybody can see what they need to see, they know how to turn in their assignments, they know how to watch videos, all of that, those procedures are going to be what we're going to be focused on that first week of school. And that is no different than what we would do any week if we were in person or not. Procedures are the key those first couple of weeks of school. So um, I, I, I don't I understand the confusion, um, but I want the community to understand that it, it, the, whatever platform we're using isn't really the big issue. The issue is, are you going to have a teacher? Are they going to be touching base with the kids? And and how does that look on a day to day basis for that particular classroom? Can you uh, just expand on that a little bit? What does that look like in terms of the amount of contact time that a student will have with a teacher? Um, and and what can, how do parents balance that as, as they look at, you know, in my case, I live in a 900 square foot house. And so that means that if we're all home, we're all working in the same room and uh, that can be challenging. So how much contact will they have with teachers and how will it vary? Well, again, it depends on which school you're in. Um, so I don't want to I don't want to be too vague here. But if you're in the online um, in our in our Boise online school, um, I think you can plan on depending upon the age level between two to four hours of face to face instruction with your kids. And again, some of that is going to depend upon maturity levels and that kind of stuff. Um, as we get into the our virtual opening with our in-person school, um, that is going to be a regular schedule like you would have any other day in a, in a school. So if you have a secondary student, they're going to have their first period class, they're going to have their second period class and on. Um, the uh, In the elementary world, they're still going to have their reading time and their math time and their social studies time. So it's the the biggest difference between the two is as we start in person schools virtually you're going to follow the same kind of a schedule that you would if we were doing this in person if you're in the online world there's going to be a little bit more of some individual work uh, with some regularly scheduled in person time with your teacher but it'll vary by subject matter and by um by instructor it is it's pretty wild how quickly we're adapting to this whole uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Now, Kelly, the great thing about having you on this panel is Idaho Virtual Academy has been here in Idaho since 2002. So you've had close to 20 years to master online education. As this pandemic has really gained steam, have you seen a big increase in enrollment? And has that imp impacted your ability to deliver high quality programming? Well, that's a great question, Matt. Um, we definitely have seen an increase in interest. Uh, we know numbers are, are fluid. People are uncertain about what's going on. Um, but absolutely, with our, like you mentioned, we have a lot of experience. We've been doing this for years. Um, we have training set up for teachers, new teachers, and professional development to go on. And um, we are set up to serve each of our students. Like like all schools, that's what we want to do. and. Um, we're really looking forward to educating returning and new students this year and and know that it's it looks a little different this year with as many new students have have as have shown interest to um, just working very hard to ensure that we can serve them getting the training done our, our teachers just came back yesterday and I'll agree with Kobe teachers are um, crucial in the, the um, formula here too and we're just training them and very excited about that too. We also have strong start programs for our students where they, the student and the parent learn about the online school and and probably Boise School District is doing the same too. But, but we found over the years, parents and teacher and students really need to be trained in um, how the education is delivered online. And so we have advisors as well for each student to help um, with the transition if they're transitioning this year. You know, the the Boise Metro Chamber has the Convention and Visitors Bureau underneath it. And so we work very closely with the Boise Center. And the Boise Center has been highly dependent and is built around these large group 
programs in conferences from all over the world. And Andy, last week, the IASA had their annual conference at the Boise Center on the Grove. And the Boise Center on the Grove submitted plans to Central District Health that were approved. And that included temperature scanners, mask mandates, and then rooms that are built for 300 plus people only could hold 50 people and they were individualized each at, a, at their own table. So, you know, you occupied a ton of the Boise Center for this conference. The reason I ask that is those are really serious precautions that were taken to make sure that the school administrators conference went off without a hitch. What are the minimum expectations statewide that your organization would expect to ensure the safety of our students as they head back into the fall? And while I understand there's going to be local variances based on whether or not we're in a red zone, a yellow zone, but what are the minimum minimum expectations that your organization is recommending the school administrators follow? Well, we're, we're saying follow the plan that you created at your district level. Um, you know, and, and each each district is working with, you know, their health districts to formulate those plans as they go out. You know, we had that conference and and we learned a great deal from the conference. And we, we had to be able to show that if schools are going to go back into session of some kind, we had to be able to model what does it look like. And in this case, uh, we had great partners with Central Health and with the center on uh, the, the Grove to meet all of these fashions. I can tell you that it was really interesting talking to a group of people in a room that will hold 200 plus people with only 50. And, and it, it was interesting to see that different in dynamic. Um, you know, and, and we, we learned a lot. We learned that people still have this fear of the unknown of, of what health guidelines are gonna be from region to region um, to how quickly the COVID stuff changes it's not quite day to day anymore, but it certainly keeps continuing to change in, in the direction of there, um, you know, the mental health impacts and things like that. So we're, we're saying as an organization, continue to follow those plans, the guidelines that were put out from uh, the, uh, the state department, or excuse me, the uh, state board and those, those plans that you've created with your local school boards and and work on making sure that you're keeping our students and staff safe. What are some of the what are some of the common themes that came out of the conference? Where what are what are some things that most districts are all implementing? Um, it it I recognize the importance of each school district having their plans because some places like you know southeastern Idaho have very few cases, but there but there seems to be some common themes that came out of your conference. Well, I think one of the biggest comments, the biggest theme was the need to get kids back in a brick and mortar setting, um, you know, and, and how we go about doing that. And we had the conversations and we, and uh, both Central Health and Southwest Health came to answer questions as well. Um, you know, and, and obviously we had tons of questions and conversations about, you know, the social distancing, the mass transportation, um, all those different parts of, of safety and, and, you know, the need for plexiglass. I mean, we've, we've just seen this whole array of what people are going to do to try and keep their kids and staff safe throughout the different buildings. And it, it's, it's such a spread. I mean, it, it's all over the place in what people are doing to make those precautions. But again, they're doing it with their local health districts to make sure that uh, they're meeting what their community requires. Um, you know, and, and again, the fear of the unknown, there, there's so much mental and, and social emotional impact on these students from being out of the building so long and being isolated from friends and different things like that. And, and we're certainly seeing a change as, as especially in rural districts as these kids are getting together and hanging out and, you know, the implement, the, the implement implications of what's going on with just the mental side of things. Um, you know, we, I've spent quite a bit of time talking to both health departments and some regional health folks about this issue and, and trying to reach out and help districts because in a lot of rural districts, they don't have access to those kind of things. So, you know, everything's being talked about. I, I haven't seen anything or heard of anything that any more surprises me or that, uh, that hasn't been addressed. And, and part of the reason for the conference again was to bring 
all those leaders around the state into one place so they could answer questions to the, we had just over 200 people show up to the conference and, and be able to have those conversations. Uh, Dennis or Kobe, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, never before has the um, confluence between the strength of our economy, the ability to have our kids in schools so parents can work for the most part, uninterrupted, and for that matter, the importance of those early child education centers that many of Boise School District has available for parents for early childhood, never has that been more apparent. The Boise School Board, the Boise School District's board decided to go virtual on August 17th with the plan to go back to in-person education on September 8th. Can you enlighten us on the logic behind this plan and what some of the contingencies are moving forward? You bet. Um, I, I, I think um, the, the first thing I would say is, is that um, our goal 100% is to get kids back into school. Um, you know, Matt, you, you said that really, really well. Um, there is an unbelievable balancing act that is going on right now. Um, I, I have never seen a situation where I agree with every side of an issue. Um, when somebody, when, when, when the parents have called me or emailed me and said, how can you dare open school given the situation that we're having right now with substantial community spread, th those parents are right. Um, on the flip side of that is how can you not open your schools right now um, because you're damaging our kids emotionally, um, we need to work, um, all of those things, and, and those parents are right. So th this idea that there is a simple answer to this is just, there, there's just not. Um, and so the logic behind what we were trying to do is we had to kind of set forth with, an, um, with some guiding principles uh, that helped us make decisions as we move forward. And one of those was we want to get back to a five day a week in-person learning as soon as possible. So given the situation where we are right now and listening to the, the public health experts as well as um, some doctors that we have um, hired con as consultants. So we worked specifically with Central District Health. We're working with Mark Nasser from St. Al's as a consultant. And given the, the situation that we're in, in the heart of the outbreak in the state of Idaho and Ada County, um, it was determined that it that now is not the time to be bringing kids back into our schools and risking additional community spread. So, but that doesn't change the goal of getting back into school as soon as possible. So working with those folks, uh, we felt like we had five weeks between the order of us being in a red category and the start of uh, the Tuesday after Momo uh, Labor Day gave us a five week period of time where we felt like maybe we could get control of um, the, the spread of the virus to the point where we could open schools safely. Um, so that was kind of the logic behind that. And, and I guess I will, I will tell you um, this, and, and, and please understand this is not a political statement, but we, folks have to wear their masks. We have to physically distance and we have to wash our hands. Those are things that are in control for every single one of us. And if the goal is to get back into school and open school safely so that we're not dealing with the confluence of uh, safety versus economics, then those are the things we need to do in order to make that likelihood happen sooner rather than later. Um, our board did not feel like it was appropriate to push this out to the end of a nine week period or the end of the semester um, because we want to get our kids back as soon as possible. So that's really where we are. We will continue to work with Central District Health to, to kind of get back to what you asked me about contingencies. We'll continue to work with Central District Health. We'll continue to work with Mark Nasser. We'll continue to, uh, to consult with the city of Boise. And, and listen to our parents. And when it is safe, we're going to get those schools open as soon as possible. You know, uh, Kelly, you've got so much experience with the online delivery program. And it's been well reported that while offering um, more flexibility to families, 
uh, virtual education sometimes leads to lower uh, student outcomes. And often that's related to parent engagement, the amount of time the student is actually spending in front of the screen. But what are some of the tools and tricks of the trade that you all have learned to try to drive up those uh, outcomes so that we continue to meet the desired statewide outcomes for our education system, but dealing with a system that's less supervised, more on their own, it's, it's a lot harder to get students there. Talk a little bit about how, what you all are doing. Sure, thank, thank you, Matt. Um, first of all, I'll say state assessments are an in, inadequate snapshot of a student's experience, progress or challenges. We enroll students through the year, um, quite a bit come along on the year and some they're coming to us for a reason too. They may be behind, we have highly mobile students, we have at-risk students. And so the ones that are enrolling even later in the year, the state test score can demonstrate what the student came to us with. And um, we do have a lot of tools that we're working on and uh, we have advisors, as I have mentioned. So speaking of engagement, uh, if we have many tracking tools and uh, we can see what's happening in the classroom, we can see how often they're attending the live classes, and we can intervene and we do. We have the homeroom teachers, we have the content teachers, advisors work with the families uh, if they need some help scheduling or technical problems or, or whatever it is um, to help bring that engagement up too. So um, I also want to point out that, um, that we're so lucky to have school choice in Idaho and, and kind of addressing some of the things that have been said. Uh, I think that there's no one school right for every single student. And there are some thrive in one setting and thrive in another. And um, parents are very lucky to have this choice. And I just felt so fortunate that I, I really feel for the school district's brick and mortar to have to make that transition so quickly and hard for all the families I know. And I know a lot of people that work in the schools and, and families and, uh, it was nice in our school to be able to have the kids have a sense of normalcy when they in, in their lives because everything had turned upside down and we have that expressed from a lot of families with our our school and so i just want to give a shout out for school choice in idaho for all the schools the traditional the brick and mortar the many virtuals that are are here too and i know everyone's trying very hard to serve the kids because that's what we're here for too and um, yes we do have things in place and okay go ahead yeah, no, I was I was going to say that school choices, it's interesting that this is forcing choice uh, onto the public schools. And we're going to talk a little bit about how a lot of the how the Boise School District is adapting to special education needs and some of the other needs. But Andy, a question has come up here. You know, prior to being in your new position, you spent 10 years in a rural school district in Melba. And one of the challenges many of our rural school districts have is the ability to ensure that there is internet access across the entire uh, district. So how does that impact some of our rural school districts when they're making decisions about moving to potentially virtual or online education? And what are the contingency plans to be able to ensure that students actually have internet access in their home if need be? Well, that that's a great question and it, it, it is a huge issue and you can bet that uh, on my docket for things to talk about with legislators this year is, you know, getting infrastructure throughout the state of Idaho. Uh, you know, where I was at in Melba, when you pushed out, so our teachers would teach live on the internet. And when you push that out, as that crossed the river, it would go to about a filament of wire. And if two kids in the same household tried to get onto, you know, two different teachers at the same time, it wouldn't work and it would slow it down so much that the whole region on the other side of the river couldn't do it. And so we had to quickly transform from a complete online system to a blended system that had the ability to have packets and different things that we had to take out every week. Uh, and we dropped them off at the bus stops at each district. So, or at each household. So, you know, we really had to, it, it really is an issue. And, and while we've only talked about the issues in rural districts and, and their internet access, uh, some of the bigger accesses that we found um, is that in a lot of the urban areas, while there is internet access, parents don't have the, the funds to either afford internet access or the devices. And those numbers are as high or higher than 
the rural districts that don't have access at all. So it's a very large problem. Um, State board created the digital divide task force. Uh, there's about 30 plus million dollars in there to start addressing these needs and issues. And that money's available for districts right now. So that's, that's a start and it's a band aid to start fixing these issues. Um, but there's a long way to go. And, and definitely we're going to have to talk about infrastructure and working with local business to be able to uh, push that kind of infrastructure out as far as how we're going to decide or how a district decides on that. You know, we only have so many options. And so as they go out, we're recording almost all our classrooms. And, and so kids can do those at different times during the day, not all at the same time. And then, like I said, many districts are putting packets and different things together to make sure that there is education going out to kids. You know, that that comment you made about difficulties in our urban environments, I mean, some of the economic issues that families are facing in Idaho are uh, extremely apparent in this environment. And, and uh, Kobe, you know, it's difficult to see how exactly two things. One, we address those students who have special needs and have uh, additional needs in order to reach their learning outcomes. How do we do that online and virtually and make sure, how do we make sure that students have access to the device or the internet in our districts? And then the last question is, what about those students that need a safe place to learn while their parents work out of the home? Like yeah. my family's lucky. My, my wife is still working at home, but you know, some, most many families, they don't have that luxury. They're being asked to come back to the office. And so how do we, you know, I don't think most school districts really ever even considered that until now. Like there are some kids that just don't have a safe place to learn uh, without those school buildings. Yeah, Matt, I, I, you you hit it right on the head. And 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 before I get into the answer to your question, I want to I want to kind of echo something that uh, Andy just said. Um, Andy and I talk a lot. Um, um, him coming from uh, Melba and me being in Boise, we have different needs. Um, our our urban areas sometimes have different needs than our rural areas, but but the the issues are still the same. So I mean, even though um, you know, in, in some of our rural communities, it's internet access in the, in the urban areas, it's actually, um, device and time and place issues, but they're still the same issue. And that is how difficult it is for families when we can't open our schools. Um, so I want to compliment Andy and, and the digital divide task force, because I know they're taking on a, 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 an issue that we've known about in the state for a long time. Um, and the fact that they're working on, on, on solutions to that is a huge help. So to your question, though, about um, educational needs for our most vulnerable populations and then where, how, does, how do families handle the safe place issue? Let me start with this. Um, we will be, even during our virtual opening, we will be contacting our um, families of kids who have needs, whether they're special ed needs, ELL needs, whatever, and, and scheduling time for those kids to come in and be face-to-face -face with those teachers to meet those educational outcomes that we're looking for. These will not be large groups. We'll keep them controlled. We'll be using our safety protocols, but we still have to get those kids into our buildings so that we can address their individual education needs uh, as we move forward. Um, as far as the safe place for, uh, for people, um, we, we recognize the dilemma here. And so one of the things that I will say is we have partnered with um, the City of Boise, a Boys and Girls Club, YMCA, and Parks and Rec to create some safe places for kids that are at, at either no or low costs that families can utilize in order, if they have to go back to work, a place they can go and still be able to take part in their educational experience and have a safe place so that they're not left at home when they're too young for that to be appropriate. Um, so those those are the things that we're doing right now to try and ease that burden. I think it 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 has amazed me to some extent and not surprised me to some extent of the the critical critical role that a school system plays in the functioning of the not only economic but the emotional stability of a community. 
And so we have to provide as much of these kinds of services as we can um, and continue to work when we're falling short. Kelly, the, the challenges, you know, like I mentioned, we have a two-year-old. We were home with our daughter, and I think we're both very engaged parents, but I did watch my daughter Louise regress a little bit over a period of two months, um, and it had largely to do with there were times when both Elizabeth and I had to work, and online education really does require a strong and stable support system in the home life in order for uh, students to effectively achieve. What are some of the pointers that you could give to parents who are about to embark on something they never planned for, they never anticipated. What are some of the things that you all recommend to your students and your students' families to help ensure that they succeed? That is another great question, Matt. Um, well, whether a student is schooling in a traditional school or at home using the school's online program or through uh, a virtual school, we all know it's really important that that student have a reliable support system and usually it's a parent correct like you were saying um so schooling at home i here's some tips and i know that uh my uh, karen from uh, inspire gave these tips similar to me we have the same things be organized have a plan for the day you know your kids are your priority and so make the plan and it, it, you might be schooling in the that evening or afternoon with them a little bit too, or, or helping them through something. They have teachers, of course, too. And so, again, I think Kobe was saying, depending on the, the student and the, the parent, uh, that can be, that can look different too. Uh, communicate, stay in contact with uh, teachers, uh, advisors, school staff uh, to help you. If you have questions, ask. And um, in our school, we have amazing tools for complete visibility into the student's online school. So, so parents can see exactly how much time a student is spending in their algebra class, uh, how long they took on a lesson, how long they spent in the quiz. Uh, all they have to do is pop in there and look. And so they have that accountability. Hold your kids accountable too. And again, it's going to depend on the different ages, how the extent to that. But all, all kids need some accountability like we all do, right? Um, and maybe you have to elicit a little bit of help from a, a grandparent or, or something like that are things that we've seen too. But those are a few tips that, that I have. You know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't force uh, Dr. Grover into a little political conversation here as well. You know, the health districts were created plus or minus 50 years ago. They've worked very well over the years to ensure that if there was a measles outbreak or if there was a meningitis outbreak in a high school, they did have the power to basically um, put down a statement that forced a closure of a school in rare circumstances. And the health districts were specifically set up to be insulated from substantial political interference. And now here we are with the COVID-19 pandemic and there's a lot of talk, particularly at the legislature, to try to strip the health district of that ability to decide we need to close something down in order to prevent any further infection and protect public health. Where is your organization on this conversation? Because it is important. I don't think that the public really realizes how important and how effective the health districts have been up until now, except for that some people don't like what the health districts have been deciding based on the science. So speak a little bit to where IASA is on this and what your take is with regard to the public health districts and its role with the school districts across the state. So, it, I mean, again, it's a mixed bag. And, and what I'll tell you is that it comes down to governance. And so you have elected boards, you know, anywhere from five to seven people that were elected and their main charge is to educate and the safety of children. And so having outside groups that can come in and shut them down uh, is not a good precedence for government or for governance of a district. And you know, while it's not against the health department, because every district I know of is working with their local health departments and most health departments want to be in the role of advisory. And so it's, it's more just a, a matter of semantics of figuring out, you know, do we, do we have an elected board that's able to make decisions for their local communities or don't we? And so that's kind of the question there. You know, the other issue that's arisen is that because there's seven separate health districts across the state and they're all able, able to make the determination of what 
uh, community spread is, and it's not consistent across the state, nor are decisions being made that are consistent across the health districts, that there is some issues there that, you know, one group may be held accountable to something another group may be. I mean, one of those big issues right now are masks. You know, that's a huge debate across all the state right now. And, and is a face shield sufficient as a mask uh, for elementary kids when a teacher's trying to teach um, the elementary kids who need to be able to see their lips to figure out grammar and, and phonetics. So, you know, it's, it's not a question of trying to throw health departments out or do anything like that. It's a question of governance and allowing those elected officials to take care of the districts they were elected to oversee. So, yeah, I mean, you bring up a great point. I mean, a first grade teacher is using uh, pronunciation as a way for teaching. So there does need to be that visibility to be able to see the teacher's lips. Um, can you speak a little bit more to this whole mask argument? Because a clear plexiglass shield over a teacher might be a tool that can be used for that. But do the students where is the argument taking place? Is it the argument that the students should have to, shouldn't have to wear masks or is it an argument of what kind of masks are efficient? Because those are two very different conversations. And I will say they are both going on. I've seen surveys to parents where, you know, over 85% of the parents said, my kids won't come to school wearing a mask. And, and again, this is generally in rural districts where there is not a lot of spread, um, but that, you know, there's some fear. It's, you talk about athletics and there's been conversations that, you know, students weren't playing football are going to have to have a mask on. And, you know, and then you have all kinds of other health issues that come into play. So I've seen that I've seen the argument all over the place, um, you know, and, and if if reducing the spread by doing something in, in a coverage, then you know, again, if that's what the health districts are recommending, then that then local boards should take that under consideration. And, you know, most that I've seen are providing PPE for uh, all their teachers are, are, you know, getting them both face shields and some type of mask. And then students, it, it really the conversation has been more around the age, you know, trying to figure out how you're going to keep a mask on K3 when those kids are, you know, we can't even keep them from not touching each other. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues of just the reality of, of trying to implement some of those things. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Kobe, there has been a lot of discussion about what are we doing to protect the teachers? Are we providing the teachers with enough training and new curriculum? Are they going to have access to new and better curriculum? So let's just talk a little bit about what what steps we're taking to protect teachers. We know that across the state, 25% of our teachers are over the age of 55. And on the whole, our average age of teachers ranges from about 30 to over 55. So we have a lot of teachers that might be in that that higher risk category, 45 and older. Um, but we also know that this rapid transition to online and virtual education, like Kelly talked about, has put a tremendous strain on teachers. So just talk a little bit about what the Boise School District is doing to ensure that the teachers have the resources they need, they have the training they need, and they're kept safe so that our, our viewers can understand where we're headed with that. Well, um the, let, let me start with this. Um, the short answer is we have bought um, uh, thousands and thousands of masks um, for our district, for not only for um, our teachers, but also for um, our, our students as well. Um, we have bought face shields. Um, we have uh, bought, um, in some cases, some plexiglass um, for our main offices. Um, anywhere that there could be outside traffic. We have we are limiting the number of people who have access to our school during the school day to create those pods within the in the day. Um, we, we've done a number of, of the PPE issues um, in order to get those things in place. Um, I think it's important to, to kind of just piggyback a little bit on, on what Andy was saying. Um, I think it's important to understand that um, the, the combination of uh, face masks or shields, social distancing and washing hands creates kind of an overlap 
of safety procedures. Um, there is all three of them working in conjunction with a, one with one another can reduce the spread significantly. It doesn't mean it's unsafe if one of those things isn't in place at any given time. So um, I think that's an important piece to understand about this as well. So you can be six feet from someone uh, physically distancing and having a conversation without a mask on um, as long as that doesn't extend beyond 15 minutes. So there's a lot of different rules as, that, is a, that, are, that play into how Central District Health or how um, the school district is implementing safety procedures. Um, to your question specifically about, um, about our teachers and what we're doing, um, we understand that there are going to be times where our teachers, uh, somebody's gonna get sick in the building. Um, we have worked on those protocols and how that's going to be dealt with. We have a decision tree um, of a series of questions uh, that um, when we are notified of a positive case, we will work through that decision tree. We will help Central District Health with our contact tracing um, and then notify those employees who may or may not be at risk um, based upon the contact tracing that's going to take place. The other thing I'm going to talk a little bit about is um, we have we have currently have about 900 substitutes in our substitute pool. Um, and so that's going to allow us an opportunity uh, to, if someone gets sick, to have our teachers stay home, uh, get better so that we can continue down the road with the goal being not to spread the virus as we move forward. Did I answer your question? I feel like I'm missing something. No, I, I think you answered the question. Uh, anybody else can jump in here. What about, so if a teacher gets sick, um, how are how's our substitute teacher pool? Um, do we have ready access? Are there enough substitutes in line? Do we have an additional teacher pool that might be able to step in? What are some of the more complex solutions that traditionally haven't been there? You know, if a teacher was sick for a couple of days, a sub would come in, but now we've got a much larger complication going with that. So just anybody can speak to that or Kobe, if you're comfortable. Sure, I, I, I'm happy to start. Um, so let me give you a couple of things that we've done. Uh, number one, um, we are we are going to be using what I'm calling an all hands on deck approach. So we have classified instructional staff that are in our building every day, and um, those folks are going to get some the same training that our teachers are getting in order to deal with anything in a virtual world. Um, so they're going to be able to step in and help us, and they're also familiar with those to those kids if we need them to help. We've taken administrative positions in our district office and reassigned them uh, to help us with any sort of um, holes or gaps that we may need to fill. In addition to the 900 uh, um, substitutes that we have in our pool. So those are the ways we're gonna deal with these kinds of things because first and foremost, when someone gets sick, we want them to get better. We don't want anybody to be thinking that we can't move forward with education if we if the teacher is sick. That is just not true. We can. Will it be to the quality? That's debatable. There's no substitute for that child's teacher. But can we limp through for a, a few days while that teacher gets better so we can have that teacher for the year? Absolutely. Kelly you know you're connected nationally to a lot of different virtual groups and I just wanted to ask you have you seen any national trends and do you think that this realignment in education is an episodic realignment in other words of after the this pandemic subsides and we go back to the normal ways of being or do you see this as a much more permanent shift in our educational delivery models um yeah matt well the need for online learning options at the school and district today level today is changing the way america looks at education forever um, I remember years ago when um, the Luna laws came in and and wouldn't it have been nice if <laughs> that would have all implemented, right? And everyone would have, would have had a device and connectivity and all, all of those things. And I don't know if that would have covered everything, but I, I we're all learning as I, I think Dr. Grover was saying, and, and uh, um, it's, we are learning what's going on. It's going to change forever. And I actually have seen some, uh, 
some survey study, studies on this. It said 77% uh, of parents agree that online education would serve as a solution to addressing the educational value lost while schools closed during the pandemic. 71% agree that, that online education should be on an ongoing option after the pandemic subsides. I mean, what if power goes out or something like that too? Wouldn't it be nice for all schools to just be able to nimbly switch to something like that too? 85% um, agree that the school district should have an online backup plan even after students return to school. And I think that the, the brick and mortars are thinking of this. And uh, again, who would have thought we would have been here this year? And, and um, crisis uh, makes us learn and grow and we can serve our kids better through, through doing this. To your point, the, the third piece, so the Luna Laws for those folks, the Luna Laws had a lot to it, but that third piece of moving forward with uh, getting a device in every student's hand statewide had a lot of merit to it. And had that taken place and it wasn't sold as in a take it or leave it package, we might actually be in a different place now. Um, Andy, student assessment is, is a topic of concern for us as well as we move to this. You know, we know that dual enrollment classes can be delivered uh, virtually for high school students, but what about some of the lab classes, chemistry labs? What about uh, technical education courses? Some of the more hands-on stuff. Um, do we think we can effectively do that statewide so that we can continue to meet the economic needs of the state? Um, and if so, What's your take and, and how is that going to look? Well, I think that we are adapting to all these different situations and we've seen some really cool things come out of some of the CTE courses that already exist as, as this has gone, you know, uh, to an online setting. A lot of our students that were working or, or mentoring under a company have gone to work for those companies and are actually doing internships with them. So they're actually getting way more on the job training because they're there and actually doing it than they were prior. So we're seeing different groups and different programs adapting and, and in some cases making it way better. And, you know, and then in other cases, like in a science lab, um, while there's some great uh, video and different things like that, you do lose that hands-on ability to create things. Um, but I've also seen, you know, science teachers that have created lab plans that students do at home from just regular things they have around the house. So, you know, in this scenario, we have some of the best teachers in the world right here in Idaho, and they do adapt and figure out how to make some of these plants, some of these things work, you know, while being in a school and, and having, being able to do some of these hands-on things, such as a lab would probably be a better course. Uh, you know, we are providing instruction that allows for at least the basic understanding of these labs to happen. We're getting to the, we're getting close to the end here. The, you know, COVID-19, if there's one thing that I learned is that uh, it has placed the parent-child relationship under a bit of duress. I mean, families are in their house and uh, it's difficult, obviously. So before I have us all sign off here, maybe we could do a quick round robin and just what's your advice to parents who continue to deal with the fatigue of this and the challenges that they know that they have as they need to work and make sure that their kids are learning? Let's start with you, Kobe. Okay, we can start with me. Um, yeah, I think that that, that is the, the, the biggest challenge that we face as a society right now is, re, is maintaining relationships, whether it's, it's a parent-child relationship, whether it is a teacher-child relationship, whether it is a co-worker to co-worker relationship. And, and I guess what I would say is continue to reach out to those people that you trust and continue to work on building those relationships with your child. So. Um, you know, our teachers are not um, counselors, but what they can, they do know is child behavior. So as you're working through these difficult situations that you're going to have at home, don't be afraid to include your child's teacher in those conversations because there are always solutions in my mind of ways that we can adapt to your child's needs, and your family's needs. So one of the biggest advice I can give is don't be afraid as a parent to reach out to the teacher and say, here's what we're struggling with as it relates to the academics. 
And this is how it's affecting our family because we can get resources to you as an institution and we can brainstorm solutions for you and with you to try and help balance those issues at home. Um, and, and so that's probably my biggest advice. Um, you know, we're gonna do everything we can as an institution to help ease the burden while we're in where we are. Um, but I'm just gonna keep saying it. We need to do the things we can do right now so that we can get back to having kids back in school because as soon as we can get kids back into school, some of these issues are resolved. And, and so we need our community to rise up here a little bit and do the right things so that we can get our kids back into school. Um, and I'm just gonna, and I'm gonna keep saying that Matt over and over and over. And I'm gonna say, it's not a political statement. This is an educational statement. So let's, let's do the right things here. And I think we're gonna be all right. Kelly, thoughts? Thoughts are, that is great advice, Kobe. <laughs> Very, communication is key. And the school does have a lot of resources our, as we do too. We have counselors, we have a social worker, uh, as I said, advisors, we're implementing social emotional learning across the grade levels. Um, those things will definitely help. So I agree 100% with everything that you were saying there, Kobe. Um, going back to, I was on a panel a couple of weeks ago with a parent who's gone through virtual education. They chose that in Colorado, I believe, for years. And someone asked her a similar question for that, like they work, like you had said. So it kind of goes back to other things that we've been talking about as well. But um, she, her advice was, first of all, what's the most important thing in your world? It's it's your children, correct? And that's it's your children and the prior prioritization you your schedule might be a little bit different you going back to here you need to organize have a schedule um schedule time for yourself as a as a parent too because that's going to be very important um but again if you if it is necessary and you have to work with your student or help them with their homework the same as in brick and mortar too it might be in the evenings it might be on a weekend and what she said at the end of that was you know, maybe I gave up Zumba, but is it worth it? She has some graduate, you know, graduate students, she has still some in too, that are just thriving and doing very, very well. And when we put our kids first, which I know that, that we do, and organize yourself, I, I think that will help too. But again, lean on resources of the school as well. And um, just one, once again, want to say how fortunate we are to live in Idaho with the school choice and looking at individual kids and thankful for our legislature for allowing school choice. Andy, Dr. Grover. I just want to echo what both Kobe and Kelly have said. It's about communication and it's about the parents choosing what's best for their kids. You know, this, the thing I think to understand is that, especially like in, in Kobe's position, you have two sides to every single issue and sometimes even three and four sides to those issues. And so, you know, Parent voice is being heard in every district. I, like I said, I think there's been surveys put out in every district saying, what do you want? You know, what, what do you need? And those are in all those conversations, you know, and so be patient with the schools. You know, we're going to see rural districts open over the next couple of weeks in some sort of fashion where kids are going to be back in school and we're going to see how those work, you know, and there's, there's lots of comments of people coming from out of state because they know Idaho's going back to school and parents are tired of having their kids at home. So we're going to see all kinds of changes. And, and I think that is one of the beautiful things in Idaho is that our teachers really adapt well to whatever situation we throw them into, whether that's just because they have to or, or you know, or because of their love for the profession. But, you know, as parents, some kids have excelled online right? That we didn't even know they would. And, and they should have the choice to be able to continue to do that. And others have found that, you know, they need them back in the classroom tomorrow. And so, you know, as parents, you get to make those decisions and, and we want you to make the best ones, but keep that communication open. Talk to those teachers. I mean, those teachers are available for at least eight, nine hours a day. And, you know, my wife is actually an English teacher and she'll be answering questions till, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, trying to make sure that her students are getting what they need. So, you know, keep the communication open and keep asking because we're all learning together. And there were a couple comments here at the end that indicated that we weren't talking about the flip side of this, which is the economic 
struggles faced by single parents who don't have a place to put their kids. I, I want to point out that there's an article that was added in the comments that kind of talks about some of the things the Boise School District is doing to help those single parents and help those families who are unable to stay home. We understand that that's a huge issue and that's probably the single biggest issue is balancing that between the safety of families and ensuring that our economy can keep pushing on. I want to thank you three for joining us today. Um, Kelly, it's great to spend some time with you and, and get your expertise on virtual education, which most folks are brand new to now. Um, and Dr. Grover and, Co and Kobe, it's just a pleasure seeing you two both again. And to those of you that are watching these, we appreciate you so much. We hope that they're educational. We know that there's a lot of content out there for you to watch. And we want to thank our sponsors one more time. Sparklight has just been incredible to us. And we are honored to have D11's Evans Bank as a sponsor for this event. Thank you again. And we'll be back next week with Dr. Burt Glandon talking about some of the major pivots that the College of Western Idaho has made to ensure their students are safe and they're ready to go to add to our economy. Thanks to all three of you and thanks to all of you watching.